Dr. Junwoo Jang is a postdoctoral research fellow in Michigan. He received his PhD in KAIST in Korea. And his expertise is in marine robotics uh, and he's worked uh, on robot navigation using reinforcement learning and control. And his work has been implemented on um, autonomous surface vehicles and other types of robots. Uh, which is a particularly challenging environment to work with, and putting electronics in water is not um, something natural to do, which makes marine robotics very interesting, and it's very close to space robotics in terms of being in extreme and harsh environments. Um, so with that, I let Jumbo to teach us what is marine robotics, okay. why it's important, and what it takes to get in. Okay, thank you for the introduction. And hello everyone, my name is Junu Zhang, and I'm excited to discuss a topic that might be unfamiliar to many of you. And today I will present mobile robotics in marine environments. And the goal of my presentation is twofold. First, I aim to provide a broad introduction about the marine robotics, focusing on their role or their value or their meaning. And because we don't usually see these kind of marine robotics in our daily life, so it can be interesting, I guess. And secondly, I will, I, I will briefly share the research that I have conducted so far. And I will try to focus on high level of abstraction and ideas that, so I will not go deep into technical details in this lecture. And I just hope that this could, this idea or high level of this abstraction can be potentially benefit your own research. And let me briefly introduce my about myself. And I received, as many introduced me, my, I received my PhD degree in KAIST in South Korea. And actually, I, I gained my PhD degree from the mechanical engineering department. And I am currently a postdoctoral researcher in naval architecture and marine engineering. So my background was not relate, actually directly related to this marine research, but my previous lab have this kind of variety of marine robotic platforms. And during my PhD, I engaged in extensive experimental work using these maritime robotics platforms. And our lab has participated in international competitions. For example, our lab won the 2019 Virtual Robotics Competition. At the time, I took charge of control and planning algorithms and virtual robotics is an autonomous driving competition in a simulation environment. And our lab also have some experience on real world based competition. Uh, we secured the second place in the MBJ TRC competition last year. And these competition experience alongside conducting maritime field experiments have equipped me some practical research insights in real world environment. And I'm gonna briefly introduce some basic types of marine robots commonly studied. The most common case is the surface vehicle, which is basically an autonomous ship, and we call it as unmanned surface vehicle, USV, in short. And if you go to the underwater, we have autonomous underwater vehicle, AUV, which is usually shaped as a torpedo. And in underwater, we also use ROVs, remotely operated vehicles, which are communicating to humans through a tether and controlled manually by experts. And before we look into technical details of marine research, let's understand why it is important to our lives. The ocean environment plays a significant role in various areas, but I will focus on four items, climate, transportation, energy, and ecosystem. So let's start with the climate. The ocean covers 71% of the Earth's surface. Ocean is holding 97% of the Earth's entire water. And these massive bodies of water play a key role in shaping our climate and weather, and such as it determines where it rains or how humid it is. Also, this water is such a big energy tank because water's heat capacity is quite large and the water in ocean absorbs 90% of solar energy. And the, when the ocean's temperature rises by one degree Celsius, it makes the rise air 7% more humid, and in this extra moisture generates larger hurricanes. And over the last century, hurricanes have 
become three times more common and compared to 100 years ago, and it causes significant damages. For example, in 2022, hurricane-related damages soared to 165 billion dollars, and this is this was a huge amount of cost, which is comparable to amount of one percent of the U.S. GDP. And it is difficult to prevent or block the hurricane entirely, but better prediction can lead to quicker evacuations, and it can reduce the harm to people and properties. And for accurate climate prediction, collecting various ocean data is very important and necessary. We need information like water temperature, air pressure, wind speed, salinity, current velocity, etc. And this kind of information is really important to predict the weather and climate. And because the ocean is very large, huge, and vast, so collecting this data or manually is quite impossible. And it requires a lot of human labor, so using automated robots makes it easier and more efficient to gather this data continuously. And these robots can work together, like surface vehicle put robotic buoys in a specific area and manage all the buoys by patrolling. And anyway, robots are needed for collecting some data. Some robots can go underwater deeper than human. So human divers only can dive up to 30 to 50 meters. So anyway, we need underwater robots to gain data deeper than that kind of deep water. And by using these marine robots and collecting ocean data, we can understand the weather more, and we can understand the climate change, and we can reduce, actually, the damage caused by the natural disasters like hurricanes. The next thing is the transportation. Around 80% of world's cargo is shipped by the sea because it is four to six times cheaper and 20 to 30 times more eco-friendly than air transport. And every year, we move 11 billion tons of goods across the sea, which works out to 1.3 tons per person when you consider about the global population. And this massive scale of maritime trade represents a market value over $14 trillion globally. In addition, there is a significant number of recreational vessels in the US, and people frequently head out to ocean or rivers for fun and by riding on yachts or boats, and that creates a market worth about $20 billion. And maritime transport is a representative example for marine robotics. You can think of it like the ocean version of, ocean version of self-driving cars. In fact, the demand for maritime transport can sometimes sur surpass that for autonomous driving. And crossing the Atlantic or Pacific Ocean by ship can take over a month, and it requires long periods of boring and monotonous sailing. And automating this process can significantly improve convenience for humans. Moreover, if the ship can become fully autonomous, it does not need for onboard human accommodations, and ships can be designed more efficiently. Uh, for example, we can just focus solely on reducing water resistance, and which means we don't have to consider the human's comfort, or such as motion sickness, and we can get rid of all, all human-related facilities. And robotics, robotics technology also plays a crucial role about the planning, efficient route planning and safety. And because large ships have substantial inertia, they must start actions in advance to follow a specific trajectory. For instance, to perform a collision avoidance, a large ship needs to begin moving several minutes beforehand. And delays in response can lead to severe maritime accidents and advanced and safe control technologies in robotics can prevent these kind of big accidents. Next is the importance of the ocean in terms of the energy. In the United States, 30% of the oil and gas we rely on comes from the ocean. And this energy industry is massive and having a market value of $120 billion. And it is not just about the extracting fossil fuel energies, and ocean itself is like a giant battery 
as I said earlier, it soaks up 90% of solar energy. And this energy is transferred into, turned into the diverse kinetic energy, such as waves, tides, currents, and winds. And we can build a power plant to harness this kind of renewable energy. And in total, more than half of America's energy comes from the ocean. So it is really a big player in how we get our power. And oil and gas platforms are often located many kilometers off the coast, even if it is far away from like 400 kilometers. And I guess not many people would choose to work out in the middle of the sea, far from the land. It is kind of small, isolate, isolated island that except just plant is there, and there is actually nothing to do. And that's where robotics can make a big difference, I believe. Robots can automatically manage and maintain these kind of plants, and which could be incredibly helpful to humans. And on the plant, we might use walking robots or wheel-type robots, but underwater, marine robots are required. Uh, we, if we need to go deep underwater, we must rely on underwater robots like ROVs, and automating these operations can make managing offshore plants much easier. There are also many pipelines underwater for delivering oil. These pipelines have to be inspected periodically for potential cracks. So as they are installed on the ocean floor, this task has been done by AUVs. And finally, there are significant benefits to be gained from marine life in the ocean environment. Seafood, like they are loved by people all around the world and has a market value of about $240 billion. And also it is quite important for human nutrition. A third of global population relies on the ocean for their main source of protein. And aquaculture is an actively developing industry now accounting for 50% of seafood is comes from the ocean. It was only 13% of 13% 30 years ago. So thinking about the portion of the aquaculture really steeply increasing. So if we can we, if we can automate this aquaculture process, we could reduce a lot of cost on seafood production. Additionally, exploring marine life expands our scientific knowledge. Uh, so far, 242,000 known species, uh, uh, marine species are discovered now, not right now. And every year, 2,300 new species are discovered. And these discoveries provide opportunities to explore their unique biological traits. And uh, we can also discover new chemical components. For example, many of the medicines we use today are derived from various marine organisms. And to effectively observe marine life, it is best to use robots that mimic the movement of marine animals. And these robots can be agile and can make sudden turns or to closely follow the creatures they are observing. And they are not scaring marine animals away because they can move quietly and unlike propeller-driven controller. And many marine robots have been developed mimicking fish, octopus, snakes, crabs, and they can blend in nature and study marine ecosystem. Now, research is ongoing to improve the control of these robots and ensuring that they can navigate the underwater environment and observe marine life in their natural habitat without giving some disturbances. So until now, we have explored the importance of the ocean and how robots can be used to efficiently harnessing the ocean's value. However, marine robotics face unique challenges compared to land or air robots. In underwater environment, communication and sensor options are, not, are very limited, and many electromagnetic waves or do not penetrate the water, and also visibility through the camera is greatly reduced. Also, the vastness of the ocean means robots often need to operate for long periods, like days or weeks, and long distance over several kilometers without human intervention. So it has to be fully autonomous. Furthermore, navigating in marine environment is tricky. As shown in the picture, the movement of fish generates like complex water flows such as turbulence or vortices, which shows highly nonlinear pattern that are difficult to model. 
And we should understand these kind of complex patterns, interactions with the water to use it as a control. And the ocean's wave, currents, and tides, winds add, add this complexity and demanding robust control algorithms that can handle these environmental disturbances. So now let's see which research I did. Uh, first topic is about underwater navigation. So in order for robots and living creatures like humans or animals can to behave, they need to use sensors to gather information about themselves and surroundings. And we call that process as perception. The most fundamental aspect is knowing their exact location. And for a short distance, we can use the just IMU sensors, IMU. And um, with uh, uh, integrating IMU acceleration measurements, we can calculate the distance the robot have moved. However, if we only use the IMU sensors because of there is some noise or bias in the sensors, estimated position will diverge at some point. And we need a global fix for the locate, uh, for, so to solve this issue. And for global positioning GPS, we usually rely on GPS to pinpoint the location. And by combining IMU and GPS, we can accurately estimate the robot's position. Next level, the next level would be the understanding about the surroundings, um, uh, focusing on the distance. And this is where depth cameras and lidars came into play and in providing distance measurements and helping to build a map of the environment. And in situations where GPS is not available, like robots use SLAM algorithms to know both lo lo position of the vehicle and the uh, map of their surroundings. And after that, cameras can distinguish objects based on the color and providing semantic information. And this goes beyond simply avoiding obstacles. Um, it's about understanding what those object, objects are and how to interact with them. And this advanced level of perception is very critical in autonomous vehicle research. And level two and level three researches are being actively developed nowadays. In underwater environment, we face significant challenges with sensor limitations. And because GPS and LiDAR sensors cannot be used underwater, and camera is also extremely restricted. In murky waters, visibility might be reduced only about several meters, which is only suitable for instant reactions. And think about the vastness of the ocean. Sometimes marine robots have to move like a few kilometers, and but within this camera information, it cannot actually navigate such a long distance. And because there is a lot of sensor restrictions, underwater robots struggle to determine their precise location. And it makes basic navigation ability very important. Still, there is one good thing. Uh, we can use sonar sensors. This is similar to how marine animals, such as whales, communicate each other over long distances. And GPS technology has been commonly used since 1993, which means it's only been around for 30 years. And before that, uh, navigation for aerial vehicles relied on using terrain features. Mountains, terrains have unique shapes, and aerial vehicles used to detect these kind of unique features to know their locations. Another way to localization is using signals from several transmission towers. And by calculating the distance from the each tower, we can use tree triangulation to fix a specific position. The extreme extension of this method will be using the GPS, which uses satellites as uh, the transmission tower. And underwater, where electromagnetic waves are not effective, uh, large ships sometimes set up sonar beacons to track the position of AUVs. And however, this method requires that ship has to always follow the AUVs, and it is not that good effective way considering the vast ocean. And so relying on local transmission tower is not that effective over large areas. So using a constant map for navigation should be 
more efficient. And map-based navigation requires invariant map data. So basically, if we have some information that does not change, then from that we can estimate the location of the vehicle. On land, there are many features like we can use for, we have lots of trees, roads, buildings, and all these kinds of features can be used and can give us some information to localize. But there is not abundant information in underwater environment. What we can use is geophysical data like magnetic fields, bathymetry, or gravitational fields. And while the magnetic and gravitational fields change according to time due to the position of the moon and sun, um, these changes can be kind of, it can be modeled to some extent. However, their variations are so subtle so that only highly accurate sensors can detect them, which means we need very extremely expensive sensor to use that kind of information. So therefore, using bathymetric information would be the most practical for underwater navigation. And to measure the underwater bathymetry, multi-beam sonar sensors are commonly used. Think of this like 2D LiDAR, which measures the distance to the seafloor sea floor in, a, in a line. And except that multi-beam sonar is not that high resolution compared to the LiDAR, mapping procedure is can be done quite in a similar way, similar way with the LiDAR. Oh, in fact, Professor Ryan Mistis from our university and his former lab member, Professor Ayan Kim, are leading researchers on SLAM area, but they started SLAM research with sonar data at first. And multi-beam sonar sensors are quite expensive, so making them challenging to use frequently for the underwater robots. So more affordable option is the single beam altimeter, which measures depth at a single point. But with single beam data, there's not enough information to effectively localize using the seafloor bathymetry. So it is like trying to locate yourself indoor, like based on the distance to wall, but you have only one distance. So there could be many possible locations and making it difficult to pinpoint the exact locations. So in this context, we designed a framework to perform SLAM using single beam data. So to construct a map with single beam measurements, we need to represent the bathymetry in a simplified form. So one approach is to divide the map into a grid. The grid scale is a little bit large, and we assume that each grid is represented as bilinear panel. Then the robot can update the elevation of each panel based on its measurements. And this bilinear structure is also good for gradient-based update, which works well with Kármán filter structure. However, SLAM involves vehicle localization, and which means vehicle's position is not exactly determined, and there is a challenge in determining which panel the vehicle has to belong in. And if we could ensure the vehicles within a specific panel, we can update that panel. But we are not certain about the vehicle's location, so there might be some risk of incorrect updates. So to address this issue, we can consider a probabilistic approach to updating the panels. And initially, the robot's position is represented as Gaussian distribution because we are using Kármán filter framework. And this distribution is then divided according to the grid and that are predefined. And since the panel boundaries act as a linear constraint, we can limit the Gaussian, dis Gaussian distribution with this linear constraint. And these, uh, the distribution that are, that are applied to our linear constraints are called as truncated Gaussian distribution. And with this truncated Gaussian distribution, we can apply a constrained Kármán filter to update the whole filter structure. Thus, we can probabilistically update each panel in a correct way. So this will be the overall algorithm. Uh, we divide the probability distribution according to the panel intersection, and then we can approximate this truncated Gaussian distribution as a new normal distribution. 
uh, because we need always Gaussian distribution to follow a uh, Kalman filter structure. And each panel is then updated using a Kalman filter. And after that, we can update the overall state according to the probability weights that are belongs to each panel. So that was the proposed algorithm. And to test the algorithm, we conducted a simulation using the actual terrain data, which are obtained from Korean coast. And we assume that AUB mission is surveying the area in low mode pattern, and we compare the performance of navigation. And using only IMU data for inertia navigation, the position estimate is drifting over time due to sensor noise. However, with our bathmetric SLAM algorithm, the drift was much less and we could estimate the trajectory more accurately. And because we are using a single beam sensor that is not that informative, so we cannot expect that very accurate localization performance, but still it prevents the significant drift and maintains reasonable localization performance. And this means this research shows that potential possibility for long-term navigation of AUVs only with a low cost sensor. And next, I will introduce research on accurately modeling the nonlinear hydrodynamics of marine robots. So as you can see in the photo, the fluid flow around the moving ships shows very highly irregular patterns. And this interaction with the fluid is highly unpredictable, and the drag force experienced by the moving ship presents a challenging modeling problem. Hydrodynamics modeling is a very complex, challenging problem, and it has been intensively studied in ocean engineering society. Experiments are often conducted with small-scale ship models in test tanks. Also, we can use simulation called CFD, computational fluid dynamics, and that are the actively researched area to reduce the experimental cost. However, these simulations still struggle to produce highly accurate results and also can be time consuming. And the dynamics of marine vehicles are represented by some complex equations that is shown as in the right side. And obtaining all hyperparameters, value, hyperparameter values through experiments are, is a traditional approach to model a, dynam model a vehicle. And nowadays, so many researchers are using AI or deep learning on their research domain. And because it can solve many complex problems, and it comes from the ability of neural networks uh, because they can gain a lot of, they can get benefit from the a lot of data and also neural networks ability to represent the nonlinear functions. And which is quite a good fit to nonlinear hydrodynamics modeling problem. And the graph below shows a rising trend in research using machine learning techniques for hydrodynamics modeling since 2017. And these statistics is made for me by counting number of papers published in prestigious ocean research journal. And I have looked up all the papers at the time, but most of the research just used basic neural network structure like fully connected networks. And my research was aimed to explore how advanced machine learning technologies can be used or what is the optimal way to represent or what is, the, what is the optimal structure of neural network that can represent the hydrodynamics? Uh, so we have to think about the data. First, in terms of data-driven modeling, we need to understand the basics of the data. So typically, data are represented in numerical vectors ex existing in real number space, ranging from minus infinity to infinity. However, based on the characteristics of the data, there will be a valid subset where possible valid data sets stay in. And if we collect the data points that are represented as gray, gray color circles, and through the collected data, we can set the boundary of the in distribution data. And the goal of machine learning is to ensure that model trained on this in distribution data 
performs well on unseen data, which is also in, in, this, in distribution boundary. The ability to generalize and extend to similar data is crucial for machine learning models. And neural networks are a continuous function, and they are good at interpolating between data points. So that's why neural networks, neural networks works in many domains. So let's see an example where we use data-based model. So we are trying to differentiate cats and dogs images to, through the machine learning models. So while the data space could theoretically span all real numbers, uh, the actual valid set is limited to the range of RGB data that is 0 to 255. And moreover, in the context of classifying dogs and cats, the valid set would not include unrelated images like tigers or sheep or whatever. And we collect images of dogs and cats, and we are trying to aim to identify unseen images as that is either dogs or cats. So, however, there will be some limitation on data collecting. Some images may be valid, but may fall within our indistribution data. For example, uh, images of dog in a non-blue background, or images that have three dogs may fit the valid set criteria that was um, identifying dogs or cats, <clears throat> but it could be outside our collected data range. So in this perspective, our first goal is to gather as much as data so that the in-distribution data distribution should be identical to valid set. And secondly, we need to make the model work well for in-distribution data by increasing interpolation abilities. So from this perspective, let's consider the modeling problem. So hydrodynamics modeling can be seen as a problem of predicting from time series data. And usually, dynamics model is assumed to be Markov decision process MDP, where the system state and actions are used to predict the subsequent state. And our goal is to ensure that the state remains valid and within the in-distribution data. And the data that represents the robot state should be within a certain distribution always, and this consistency must be reflected in the modeling procedure. So usually, data-driven modeling methods do not restrict this kind of in-distribution in di properties. So it can lead to what is known as compounding error problem. So when predicting far into the future, the model is used repeatedly, which can produce values that stray from the in-distribution. And when these out of distribution prediction are fed back into the model, it leads to larger errors since the model has not trained from such data. So, that, so it deviates further and further from the actual values. And this, this issue we call it as a compounding error problem. And in this sense, if we want to obtain the accurate modeling, we need to keep the generated predictions within the in distribution. So first, let's consider the representation of the angles. The orientation of vehicle is commonly, um, it, it's a quite common state variables because all many, so many robots have that angle, use the angle information. And has the, the angle has the characteristic that zero degree and 360 degrees are equivalent. So for effective implementation in neural networks, usually we are using the trigonometric function sine and cosine to, uh, for using the neural network's input. And in 3D, angles can be represented using rotation matrices or quaternions. And these have valid range of data. So when using trigonometric functions, we have characteristics that square of the sine or plus square of the cosine equals to be one. And these constraints should be always met. And by restricting the state space to meet these kind of angle constraints, modeling performance can be improved. 
So one way to achieve this is to introduce the 60 angle representation, which represents angle in another continuous space utilizing properties of SO3 group rather than in Euclidean space. And additionally, we can consider predicting the boundary um, of in-distribution data. While we may not know the exact range of in-distribution data, we can estimate it based on the collected data. And one method for this is using an autoencoder model. An autoencoder model compresses the original data information into a lower dimension and allowing that latent space to mimic the in-distribution data space. And after the learning the latent space, we make the prediction model produces the output in the latent space. And if, if the prediction results remain in the, within this latent space, we can continuously maintain in distribution. And to achieve this, we used variational autoencoder training, but we had to overcome KL vanishing problem, which is commonly used, commonly happening in training the VAEs. And we addressed this issue using a cyclical annealing schedule or sigma VA, which auto tunes regularization terms in VAE laws. Additionally, there is a data augmentation technique known as hallucinated replay that can return the out of distribution data to the value back to the in distribution data. So this method starts with the modeling using an existing data set. The initial prediction may fall outside of the in distribution, which is orange color of x k plus one head, and we generate artificial data set pair of it, it from the x k plus one head going to the x k plus two. <coughs> so here we augment the data, this kind of new artificial data set for training the new model, which can teach the model that that can return from out of distribution to in distribution. And by doing that, we can train the model that can acquire uh, in distribution stability and thereby enhancing long term prediction performance. So we wanted to test our proposed algorithm on real hydrodynamics data. So we built a small surface robotic vehicle and deployed it in a small water tank. And we could measure the vehicle's exact position and orientation through the motion capture system. And traditional neural networks showed a significant decrease in multi-step prediction because it diverges from the original data distribution. So as shown in the below left images, <coughs> the, if we are using the just neural common networks, it, it diverges from the original distribution with the prediction horizon. However, on the other hand, our proposed algorithm can make estimate predictions maintained in in distribution and it is shown it can quite well similar to the original distribution. And for quantitative comparison, we used a classifier to identify the portion of out of distribution data. And it also observed that with Beijing neural networks also the rate of out of distribution increases significantly, but with our proposed algorithm, we can maintain higher data validity with increasing the prediction horizon. Additionally, we wanted to test whether this approach can be applied to a real, real system. Using a similar methodology, we modeled a tourist cruise boat operating in an urban canal. And after multiple operations of the cruise boat, we collected GPS and control inputs and we are trying to find out if we, could, if we could model only with this kind of simple data. And we tried modeling using traditional methods, which is estimating the hydrodynamics parameters. And we also developed a hybrid model combining this traditional model with the LSTM. And our proposed network model demonstrated higher long-term prediction performance compared to other baselines. And remarkably, we only used GPS data for modeling, and which is a very low cost sensor. So it implies that we can reduce the high cost associated with experiments to get a hydrodynamics model of a surface vehicle. And also it has the advantage of allowing the model to be updated online, and it can adapt to 
the aging of the surface vehicle. And now, finally, let's move on to our topic, about, which is about control. And the problem of optimal control has been inspiring many robotics researchers, as it involves making various robots move very impressively. And optimal control refers to the process of calculating the best action that minimizes the cost function with given a set of dynamics model. And the cost function is designed considering factors like deviation from the desired trajectory or energy consumption. And traditional optimal control theory has been developed based on linear systems. And in these systems, if you have a quadratic cost function, you can exactly calculate the optimal action, which is a method is known as the LQR, linear quadratic regulator. However, most models are nonlinear, and in these cases, uh, optimal control theory has been applied using methods linearization. And with neural networks models, which have a huge number of parameters and significant nonlinearity, linearization approach is not that effective for optimization. So instead, optimization, optimization based on sampling is done for neural network models. And researches have been conducted on control using model predictive control based on sampling. And it has been applied to many robotic systems like autonomous car or any other drones or other robots. And sampling-based optimization starts with basic techniques like such as random shooting, and it can be advanced like CEM or MPPI. Oh, there is another way to control and, uh, using the neural networks, and it can be extended to control. So even with neural network models, there is a way to utilize linear control techniques, namely through the Kupfman operator. And the Kupfman operator theory states that nonlinear system can be transformed into a linear system. So for example, consider the problem of distinguishing between data points inside or outside of the circle. And it is impossible to separate this data by only using linear constraints. However, if we lift this system into a higher dimension, so we are adding a new variable, x squared plus y squared, and we can linearly separate the data based on the plane in the z-axis, which is a linear constraint. So in dynamics modeling, we can lift a nonlinear system into a highly, higher dimensional linear system. And after that, we can use the linear control system theory. And based on Kupfman operator property, the deep Kupfman operator learns the process of transforming a system in <coughs> a nonlinear system into a linear system using neural networks. And once it transformed, uh, we can then apply linear control theory, linear control system theory. And researchers like Professor Daniel Bruder from our university who works with soft robotics are conducting control studies using this kind of approach. And even if a hydrodynamics model is not represented by a neural network, it is still a nonlinear model and it requires control methods that is suitable for nonlinear systems. And commonly used control method is model predictive control, which is a more of a framework, not a single control technique. It involves computing the optimal control action sequences over a prediction horizon. And if we apply just the first control input, and then we recalculate the optimal control for the next horizon. So for linear systems, optimization can be effectively done through quadratic programming as it is a form of convex optimization. However, for nonlinear systems, the optimization must be done through nonlinear programming, which can be time consuming due to its complexity. So let's see how classical control methods has been applied to marine vehicles. So there are some nonlinear hydrodynamics of marine vehicles. Uh, the representative model would be the Boston Dynamics model, which it describes force as inertia force, inertia, Coriolis, and damping forces. 
And these forces introduce nonlinearity, especially as the Coriolis matrices and damping matrix change with the vehicle's velocity. And there is an inherent nonlinearity in this dynamics model. We have to leverage them for control, and that will be uh, quite complex. And recently, there have many been attempts to use nonlinear MPC that optimize control input directly using the nonlinear models. However, nonlinear MPC has its drawbacks because it requires a lot of extensive computation. And to implement it in real world, we have to reduce the computation time. So we have to use model simplification, or we have to use control. We have to lower the control frequencies for real world deployment. And this kind of simplification poses limitations, and large computational burden is not the proper for proper for small vehicles or if the vehicle have large dimensions or if we have to calculate the 60 motions, then maybe we need more efficient and accurate control strategies. And we have to develop that kind of control strategies. So in order to develop an efficient controller, we use the symmetry inherent in Lie groups. So a Lie group is a mathematical structure that combines algebraic and geometric properties. In a Lie group, the manifold is symmetric and looks the same at every point, so making all tangent space isomorphic. So in simple words, when we represent the vehicle's orientation in Euclidean space, it becomes nonlinear due to the trigonometric functions or to represent the orientation in Euclidean space. <clears throat> but however, by using a Lie group to represent the orientation, we can handle the dynamics in the same way regardless of the orientation, thereby we can simplify the nonlinearity issue that comes from the orientation. So we are defining the Poisson dynamics using the Lie group. The original Poisson model aligns with the euler poincare equations. And here the Coriolis matrix is aligning with the adjoint, adjoint term, adjoint operator, while the damping control forces are treated as external forces. And we define the trajectory difference using the left error in Lie group. And this method, unlike its counterpart in Euclidean space, is not dependent on the vehicle's orientation. So we can capture the underlying dynamics more accurately. And therefore, when we linearize the error dynamics within this Lie group framework, it becomes much more accurate. And this is specifically beneficial to marine vehicles because hydrodynamics models are heavily influenced by the orientation. Also, we have to, we are linearizing the just normal dynamics model. And with both the dynamics and error dynamics linearized, we can construct a convex optimization problem for MPC. And this approach is much more computationally efficient compared to the nonlinear MPC. So to evaluate our proposed algorithm, we utilized the marine system simulator with the oral USB model, which is designed based on a 60 motion. And also, it is a, this vehicle is a two meter catamaran. It, it, is a, it is from the rear vehicle. And the model is experimentally modeled using the Boston Dynamics model. And we conducted trajectory tracking tests under conditions with ocean currents. And we performed rotational and zigzag movements to assess the vehicle's maneuverability. We implemented convex MPC with OSQP server. And for baselines, we developed a nonlinear MPC using the Kasadi tool, which is a tool for nonlinear programming optimization. Then we can compare the performance of Lee group, proposed Lee group MPC and nonlinear MPC. So the proposed algorithm shows that successful control performance that was quite closely comparable to a nonlinear MPC. And there is some, some inaccuracies on the model because we, uh, there is some ocean currents. And we do not use this ocean current model. But MPC can successfully compensate for this kind of inaccuracies through the iterative feedback. And while the position error increases with stronger ocean currents, 
the difference in control performance between our method and nonlinear non MPC is not that substantial if we are actually concentrating on the magnitude of the error. And while the control performance is similar to nonlinear MPC, the computation is about 10 times faster, and this significant improvement, improvement in computation without compromising control efficiency, com control performance, so which means it underscores the potential of our proposed algorithm for practical use. And the issue of control algorithms boil down to how quickly and how accurately we can optimize. If we utilize neural networks, we can pre-store optimized control policy and we can deploy them very quickly. And control policies of neural networks are often learned based on imitation learning or reinforcement learning, and they are very active research areas nowadays. Unlike perception problems, it is very challenging to debate which method is better in control tasks. Model-based control may struggle with properly understood models like fluid dynamics, and data-driven control can better handle such unknown nonlinearities. However, if we use data-driven control, it is difficult to guarantee the control performance because we might not collect the data in such state space. Also, while model-based control theories are comprehensible and easily tunable, data-driven control can achieve higher performance by not being restricted by the model. So we can see that both methodologies have pros and cons, and they are being actively researched within the control community. So returning to the beginning of the presentation, we discussed the challenges faced by the mobile robots operating in marine environments. So we briefly handled these issues such as localization challenges due to sensor limitation in the water environment and the complex task of hydrodynamics modeling and its application in control. And when considering the application to actual marine robots, it is very important to address the need to operate in vast and huge environment and the requirements to robustly handle the uncertainties of the real world are, yeah. So we have to guarantee the prediction performance of the model or we have to guarantee the safety of the control algorithms that, is, that will be under the external disturbances. That will be the research question and we have to study about that. So research in this area is very essential for successful application to actual marine system. And marine environments are probably the most unpredictable, complex, and sensor-restricted places. Therefore, there is an abundance of unresolved practical issues, and considerable research can be done, should be done, to explore how these can be solved through engineering approaches. So for example, we can think about the scenarios such as docking ships with tugboats or drones landing on the surface vehicle, marine vehicles with manipulator, manipulators, and cooperation between these kind of multi-agent systems. That can be done manually only by the experts, and now um, there is no technology that can be done with the control or robotics technology. So advances in modeling and control algorithms can, should be used for, this, for automation of this kind of process. And I know that many robotics researchers are concentrating on the perception part because they can easily get highlights and it looks fancy. But if you are interested in modeling and control, marine robotics can be a good application that you can study for. And that is my end of my presentation. So thank you for your attention. And I will accept questions if you may have. Anybody wants to join marine robotics research? 
How much is the pay? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the presentation. Um, I know you mentioned it kind of on the, the overview slide, but I'm interested in how you might handle kind of those external disturbances that you're talking about. Like, um, like in your, your research, you had like a, like a steady state current, ocean current, I believe. Um, but how like robust is the algorithm to kind of um, not diverging, like if, if there is some sort of disturbance um, that you're not expecting? So in a classical way, maybe we can we have to define the external dis is, is, is external disturbance is external disturbances in a, some way. So if we can model with the Gaussian distribution noise, then maybe somehow we can resolve it in a classical approaches. But if we are using the data driven approaches, like anyway, we have to know about the information of the disturbances, and we have you have to know the range of disturbances and. If we can secure that kind of information, maybe we can guarantee the performance of the modeling and control. But that is very uh, tricky, and that is actually I, I'm not sure. I don't I don't know the exact answer of that. So we are trying to solve that kind of research question. That is ongoing research, I guess. So yeah, yeah. So many. So nowadays, many people are trying to use like. For the control perspective, we can use the control safety barrier function or the, this kind of tech ideas or theories can guarantee that kind of some robustness. But um, the only thing I can say is that, yeah, that's the limitation of, of our research nowadays. And it has to be done research more and more. Yeah. yeah thank you. Yeah, thanks for the great talk. Uh, so I wanted to ask, uh, like, how you use actually VAEs to explore the latent space, and um, how, uh, like, learning the nonlinear functions um, can be really useful. Like, uh, like, how do you set up all of that, and um, like, if, have you experimented in harsh environments uh, uh, to see uh, if you are actually able to uh, surpass the performance of the MPC there, or? Uh, oh, so we. Uh, for the control for the demonstrate demonstrating the control performance, we did not. I have no experience on did that kind of in harsh environments, but what I did is for modeling the vehicle. So modeling the surface vehicle in real marine environment, we collected the GPS data and control inputs, and we have drift like currents, ocean currents, or that kind of things. So we have to collect data over few weeks, and that has variety of ocean currents. So it can reflect that kind of external disturbances can be reflected to the modeling because we have that kind of data. So it can be done. But I didn't have experience on controls that kind of harsh environment. So yeah, I'm sorry to insert that exactly about that. Yeah. Thank you. Hello, thank you. I thought your work with the, the single sonar beam was really interesting, um, but you sort of showed this in a very like feature-rich environment, I thought. So I, I was wondering if, you know, because I imagine sort of these Discovery Channel videos where you see the underwater of like the ocean in the middle of nowhere, and it's just like a flat bed of sand. So I'm wondering is, is you know, that sort of localization possible sort of in the middle of nowhere? Is there enough like actual data and landmark data to do um, that sort of algorithm, or is there a different approach that's like more common? So what I did is using the just single multimeter sensor, so that is very rest restrictive way to use that kind of information. So if you really look into the data that represent the bathymetry, some some ocean floor are very aggressively changing, so we can use that kind of features for understanding the localization. But um, it depends on the area of the ocean. So some, some area will be totally flat, so there will be no features. And that is, yeah, of course, we cannot look doing the localization on that kind of environment. So it depends on the environment. But um, there is some researches, like even in that kind of flat surfaces, there, if we have some kind of small features, like 
I don't know. <laughs> if there is some small features and just using that kind of small features, feature-based localization, feature-based slam can be done through obtaining these kind of features, but still there are not many researches have been done for the bathymetric navigation. So um, what I can surely say that I could gain uh, bathymetric data that was lucky for me and that has quite a, a lot of features on, in real environment, so that worked for my algorithms. But yeah, in, for the whole entire ocean, I don't think that there will be an uh, ultimate solution for the bathymetric navigation. Hey, uh, thank you for your uh, speech. So uh, I have a question about like, so when you test on this uh, research, do you use like the small multi-agent robots like the Heron or did you use the big one or both? Um, I have, our lab have many experiments on this kind of one way is like, it, it is about five meters scale boat and these kind of small robotic vehicles on the on the left side, the small vehicles is only about to one meter. So I have used both uh, many robotic platforms for the okay. experiments. So when, when, the, yeah. when you do the test, uh, does the wave affect the performance? Like, did um, you take account of the wave? Actually, we are not seeing the exact wave because we we experimented on the far in the middle of the sea, so we are not experimenting in this kind, using these platforms on the near coast, so we didn't see the wave or the kind of nature phenomenon. But would you ever think like the wave will affect in like in real life if there's a situation when you test it will be wave on sea and it will affect your LiDAR and everything stuff and your neural networks and everything else? LiDAR, what do you mean LiDAR? Like uh, the data when you test with um, uh, there's a present of wave. So that is the uh, uh, disadvantage for modeling using the just data driven models. So I think if you can collect ab abundant data from the waves or other external disturbances, then it will work. But I I collected the data with a calm sea, so it will only work that kind of that environment, I guess. And okay. yeah. Yeah, thank you. Can you talk a little more about um, the coastal environment and navigation versus the middle of the sea in good weather that just came up? Coastal navigation? The, right, yeah, there, there's usually a lot of research in coastal uh, navigation and along the coast up, you know, uh, ocean where um, there's, a more, there's more chance to, you know, hit the vehicle to rocks and <laughs> destroy the system and, and you know maybe it's a near a near port right um, and it's more dynamic because of you know underwater maybe uh, wildlife compared yeah. to what we're seeing right you're saying that if the weather was good you were in the middle of the ocean yeah collected the data and called it a day you got your ocean engineering paper right <laughs> so in fact um in the middle of the ocean, like we are crossing the Pacific Ocean, actually there is nothing on it. So there is no obstacles on that kind of vast ocean. So in the in the middle of sea, the automating the process will be quite easy. And that is already automated in a lot of portions. But the one of the main problem is docking. So if we are trying to dock a ship on the port near the port, yeah, because we have to control the large ship in, like, we have to predict the several minutes of the motion of the ship in advance. So that is a really challenging problem. And sometimes, yeah, it happens, the accidents happens a lot about in docking procedure. There is also specialist for, just for docking a ship. Human experts are, yeah, have to manage that. So. I don't think it can be done in uh, short periods of time. Like, I'm not sure it can be done in 
in few years. That's that's the we have to do the research about the marine robotics problem to solve this. But yeah. <laughs> But that's the all I know, and yeah, so many research items like if we, we can use the reinforced learning, reinforced learning for docking procedure, that kind of research papers are really actively shown up nowadays. But I don't think that can be applied to real world environment because reinforcement learning, we have to know the exact dynamics, exact model of the ship, or we have to simulate it anyway. But there is no exact simulation for the marine environment. So if we are trying to really implement in a real world environment, we don't know the exact amount of the external disturbances like wind or currents or that kind of something. So we cannot guarantee the safety of that docking procedure. So that's so, so uh, on that point, exactly for the problems we want to solve, we can't collect data, right? Because yeah. we have to face the disaster. Then do you think we should go back to modeling? What I'm believing is that we cannot uh, avoid all the accidents through the automation process. But if we can automate it like 95% of the procedure, then get, that can be effective for humans. So, so still having human in the loop. Yeah. Um, somehow we need some kind of like, um, because we cannot actually predict the weather. As I said, hurricanes are three times more common than 100 years ago. So we cannot never expect futures really disasters. So if that kind of big hurricane, we have never seen that kind of hurricane and it comes, we cannot actually estimate the dynamics or disturbances from the Earth. So yeah, I think that's kind of impossible question. But what our aim is to solve 99 or 99.9 point nine percent of problems can be automated.